Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on knee osteopathitis. My name is Louise and I'm your host this evening. Our expert presenter is Mr. Richard Goddard, consultant orthopaedic surgeon. This presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is on the bottom of the screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. Please note this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you'd like to book your consultation, we'll provide contact details at the end of this session. I'll now hand over to Mr. Goddard and you'll hear from me again shortly. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Benenden webinar on uh, knee osteoarthritis. My name is Richard Goddard. I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon working here at Benenden. I also work in the NHS as well at the Conquest Hospital, and I only deal in knee problems and knee surgery. So in this session, we'll go through a number of, uh, a number of topics. We'll talk about what is knee osteoarthritis. We'll talk about the stages you may experience. Uh, there's various options of treatment. We'll go through the non-surgical options and the uh, operations that could help. We'll talk about knee replacement surgery and the various options that we have for knee replacements. And we'll talk about what a typical patient would experience with their journey uh, having a knee replacement. Uh, and also we'll talk about the new um, exciting development, which is the Rosa robotic knee replacement system, which we've recently um, introduced here at Benenden. And there'll be plenty of uh, time for questions at the end of the session. Uh, so a bit about my background. Um, I trained in the University of Leeds, graduated in 1997, which uh, seems a very long time ago now. Um, I then did some research uh, at the University of London, uh, obtaining a Master of Surgery degree in, uh, it was actually a knee ligament reconstruction, uh, an MS thesis. And um, I then uh, joined the Southeast Thames uh, surgical rotation, and I now work as a consultant in the Southeast. So what is osteoarthritis? Um, the diagram at the bottom left of the picture shows a normal knee joint. And if you open a normal knee joint and look inside, you, the bone is lined with cartilage. And a good visual uh, description is if you think of a snooker ball, the white billiard ball, that's what the articular cartilage should look like. It's lovely and smooth. There's no imperfections. Um, and it um, seems almost quite shiny. And that's normal articular cartilage. So if you look inside someone's knee who's 18, the cartilage looks like a brand new snook ball. Osteoarthritis is basically wear and tear of that perfect bearing surface. And it starts with minor damage, scratches, scuffs to the articular cartilage, and then the articular cartilage starts crumbling away, a bit like an old road, and you get potholes in the road, crumbly areas, and then eventually the cartilage wears away to bare bone. And then eventually you may get bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, which uh, one of the x-rays at the bottom is showing, and that's when people have severe pain, arthritic symptoms, and usually would uh, need a knee replacement. So the symptoms of knee arthritis, it may just start with a bit of um, achiness or stiffness in the mornings. Um, you may be able to do normal daily activities without a lot of pain, but after something more excessive, a long walk, uh, perhaps playing golf or um, other sports, you may get some discomfort. You may feel the knee swells after activity and you may get a sensation of clicking, crunching, grating and grinding. And these are all early signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis. When the arthritis progresses and get very bad, people have constant pain. Uh, people have pain just sitting in a chair, pain at night, lying in bed. And uh, often patients describe they're woken up at night due to severe pain. Um, relatives and friends may notice that they're walking with a limp and their knee and leg becomes bowed and deformed. And patients then are not able to walk the distances they used to like to walk and become more housebound, chairbound. Osteoarthritis goes through a number of stages, um, and these are seen on x-rays and MRI scans mainly. It starts where there's early cartilage thinning, and on an x-ray it may look particularly, it may look quite normal, but an MRI scan may show some early cartilage loss. Then you get mild arthritis where on x-ray you see narrowing of the joint, 
and this then progresses the joint space gets narrower and narrower until all the cartilage is worn away and then one ends up with bone on bone arthritis and often this is accompanied with severe pain and limitation of activities and it's quite obvious usually on an x-ray without any need for any further imaging like an mri scan how do you treat arthritis well you have to diagnose arthritis you'd visit a gp a physio or someone like myself, uh, we'd take a history, we'd examine your knee and do various test x-rays and MRI scans. Um, the non-surgical treatment is really try and treat anything that's correctable. So if you just get pain after running 10 miles, then perhaps try cycling instead of running. That might help your pain. If someone is overweight, um, the facts and figures of being overweight are around seven times your body weight goes through your knee joint going up and down a hill or up the stairs at home. And if you just lose one kilogram in weight, this is multiplied by seven going through the knee. So a loss of, say, one stone in weight equates to a loss of seven stone of force going through the knee joint on normal activity, which really, really helps someone's pain. You may see a physiotherapy to do muscle strengthening, ligament strengthening, keep the joint mobile and supple. You may take simple analgesia, over-the-counter paracetamol, ibuprofen, or have stronger painkillers from your GP. People then try knee braces, strapping, um, often with activity, playing sports, etc. Uh, we can do various injections for pain and inflammation. You can have a steroid injection. And there's also something we use here at Benenden called uh, visco supplementation. Uh, the one we use is called Duralane, and there's a picture there on the screen. And you can think of this as a biological oil change for the knee. It's a, a vial of uh, biologically active gel or oil that's placed into the knee joint and then works its way all around and it provides a coating. And it's like an oil change in a car engine lubricating the joint. And also it's biologically active, trying to nourish the cartilage. It's important to try all of these measures first before rushing straight into a knee replacement. Um, you don't have to try every single one, but you have to try a number of them to try and improve before an operation. We then come to what operations are uh, available for knee arthritis. Uh, occasionally, keyhole surgery can be helpful for early stages. If there's just an area of arthritis with good cartilage everywhere else, then something called microfracture can be very useful where we're with keyhole surgery trying to make little holes in the bone, uh, trying to generate some scar tissue uh, to fill in the pothole in the knee. And this can help um, in the right circumstances. Um, in younger people with severe deformity, we may try to avoid a knee replacement and try and correct the alignment by uh, realigning the bone, and that's called an osteotomy. As one gets older, it's um, usually not advisable because a knee replacement is the gold standard operation for curing arthritis. Um, I've put their cartilage transplantation. This is very, very experimental. Um, again, it's, it's not for generalized severe arthritis. It's for specific uh, patterns of arthritis, commonly in younger people, commonly in an isolated part of the knee joint. But this is an up and coming and exciting technology that may be the future of the knee surgery. But at the moment, we rely on joint replacements to cure uh, severe arthritis. So a knee replacement, very common operation now. Um, I personally do around three to 400 knee replacements a year, um, mainly uh, done for wear and tear osteoarthritis that can also be used for a variety of inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid, patients with gout, and patients with previous uh, cartilage and ligament injuries, perhaps due to injury and in sport. Um, not here at Benenden commonly, but in the NHS, people who have severe fractures, falls and trauma, we do primary knee replacements to treat severe fractures. Um, the aim of a knee replacement is to cure the arthritis, which then helps the patient's pain. Um, also increase mobility, get people walking back a number of miles as opposed to only a few hundred yards or meters, uh, restore the function of the limb and to the function to the patient and try and correct the alignment of the knee. We're seeing many, many uh, younger patients now present for knee replacements and this poses an extra challenge. 
that younger patients rightly have greater expectations, uh, higher functional demands, such as they're still working and want to do various sports. And generally, everyone has higher expectations of a knee replacement. And it's important to realise that a knee replacement isn't the normal knee you were born with or had when you were 18, 20. It's an artificial joint. It's metal and plastic. It's far better and less painful than a severely arthritic knee joint, but it's not as good as the one you were born with. Um, so in the UK, there's around 100,000 knee replacements performed a year. We enter all the data on a national joint register, which as surgeons, uh, we can see our own data and our colleagues, and we can compare how knee replacements are doing for various problems in various patients, men, women, uh, various problems. The average age of a knee replacement in the country, usually every year it's around 66, 67 or thereabouts. Slightly more ladies uh, have knee replacements compared to men. Knee replacements um, are more common in, um, in younger men uh, and sort of uh, ladies as they get older. Approximately 95 percent, 94 and a half percent of patients. So 95 out of 100 um, at around six months report that their knee after a knee replacement is a lot better and many studies show that there's a good health improvement after a knee replacement. Knee replacements don't last forever, they're metal and plastic and the weak link here is the plastic bearing which is the new cartilage. They're tested in the lab on various robots and simulators and the plastic bearing just like the rubber of a car tire over time will wear away 80% of knee replacements nowadays are lasting up to 25 years, which is really good. So what are the options for a knee replacement? The most common operation and the most common type of arthritis demands a total knee replacement, where you replace or resurface the knee joint, replacing the kneecap, replacing the end of the thigh bone and replacing the end of the shin bone, the tibia. And that's the diagram in the middle. That's a total knee replacement and the X-ray on the uh, right hand side. Um, you can, in certain circumstances, if there's just arthritis in one part of the knee, do a partial knee replacement. Uh, commonly, the inside of the knee gets worn and you can do a medial uh, knee replacement. The one we use here is the Oxford knee replacement. And occasionally, but more more rare, you can replace the kneecap joint in isolation or the outside of the knee. With a knee replacement, there are many ways of doing it. So commonly, and the vast majority of surgeons use standard instruments, which means we use x-rays and various instruments during the operation to take measurements and get the alignment of the specific patient. There are other techniques. One can use computer navigation, and that's moved on now to the ROSA robotic system, which we'll talk about um, in a short while. And also there's a signature knee replacement we do here at Benenden, which is pre-planning with MRI scans. And all of these have their relative advantages over each other. Um, certain patients present late with very severe deformity and ligament injury, and then we need uh, more complex knee replacements uh, building the bone and restoring the alignment and compensating for damaged ligaments. So the take home message with this is if you have arthritis of the knee, it's better not to ignore it. It's better to get it checked out, see an expert, get x-rays and take advice. Because if you ignore it and leave it, it can get to the stage where a simple knee replacement is not going to help you. It can be cured with a more complex knee replacement, but the results of those are not quite as pleasing to the patient. It's more of a salvage type of operation. The implant we use here at Benenden is the Vanguard knee replacement. This is in the uh, top three commonly used knee replacements in the country. It has a very good track record. It has the highest uh, ODEP rating, which is the panel of orthopedic experts that monitor the data. And this has got a 10A rating, which is the best that uh, it can have. The 10 year survivorship is over 96%. This means that 96 out of 100 Vanguard knee replacements are lasting 10 years. And probably um, the predecessor was it's for the AGC that's now uh, not used anymore, but the Vanguard is the newer version of that. And at 35 years, that had 70% survivorship. The Vanguard's not been out for 35 years yet, but we're hoping the data carries on being good. 
and it lives up to the same uh, benchmarks as the uh, old AGC replacement. Uh, we use surgical cement to secure the knee replacement to the bone, and this in studies shows uh, a slight improvement over uncemented knee replacements. There's less early failures, and you can replace uh, the knee joint with or without the kneecap, the patella, and that depends on the amount of arthritis seen on the kneecap and the individual surgeon's preference. Uh, the good thing about the Vanguard knee replacement, it's very modular and for more severe deformity, which you may know beforehand or you may find out during the operation, you can swap and change and make it more uh, stabilised if necessary. So how does it all begin? Uh, you would come see one of us here at Benenden. We'd probably spend uh, the initial consultation probably 20 minutes uh, having a chat about your symptoms, finding out how sore your knee is, how it's affecting you. Have you had any injuries? Uh, we'd like to know about your past medical history. Do you have any other medical problems? Are you on any medications? Do you have any allergies? It's very important to tell us, especially if you think you may be allergic to metal or nickel, because all knee replacements contain metal or nickel. And if you have an allergy, then we can use a special Vanguard knee replacement that doesn't contain nickel, but this usually has to be pre-planned and specially ordered in. We'd want to take x-rays of the affected knee to see the damage that's there, and other imaging like CT scans or MRI scans may be required if we're not 100% uh, sure of the problem and what's going on. Uh, following this, the consultation, the examination, and the x-rays, we then tailor an individualized plan to how we should treat your arthritic knee, which could start with advice, painkillers, injections, all the way to surgical intervention. Many patients I see by the time they've got to my clinic have tried and exhausted all the conservative measures, and we just tick those boxes and accept that the next stage is a knee replacement. So what should a patient do prior to a knee replacement? Well, you need to optimize your health, it's a good idea to try and get healthy, um, try and lose weight if you can. This would certainly help your recovery, help the anaesthetic, and certainly uh, make the knee replacement function better and last longer in the, uh, in the long term. If one has pre-existing medical problems, heart problems, high blood pressure, diabetes, these should be optimised with medication and advice from your GP prior to having an anaesthetic and surgery. It's a good idea to... Do you exercise before a knee replacement, which we call prehabilitation. You can do exercises off the internet, see a physiotherapy, uh, see a physiotherapist, but this is basically getting the muscles strong, getting the knee moving the best it can. And so after the operation, the muscles have memory and know the exercises that they're meant to be doing, and it makes the recovery swifter and easier for the individual patient. Uh, once we've decided you're healthy to have a knee replacement, you've optimized medical problems it's then pre-assessment with nurse screening who will do various blood tests uh, possibly a tracing of your heart and if if there's any worry that uh, there may be medical problems then uh, you're referred to one of our anesthetic colleagues who will carefully assess you from an anesthetic point of view and discuss the suitability for various uh, anesthetic anesthetic options most patients who have a knee replacement commonly have a spinal anaesthetic rather than a general anaesthetic, which works well for pain relief during and also after the operation in the early few hours of recovery, which is very important. So the surgical journey, we've talked about the exercises before, optimizing one's health. Um, I can't stress enough if someone has diabetes, it's really important to have good diabetic control and we'll be very strict and with various blood tests, if the blood sugar levels over a period is too high, we'll want this to be lower because there's increased risk of complications, wound healing problems, uh, skin breakdown, which we don't want. And we'll also be advising patients over the rapid recovery protocol, which is really saying modern thinking after a knee replacement is to get going quickly. Don't stay in hospital very long. Get back home, get back using the knee, do everything you can yourself make your cup of tea, make your sandwich, go up and down the stairs to the loo. This is all rapid recovery and good uh, way of uh, recovering from a knee replacement and getting maximum function out of it. Patients are now commonly admitted on the morning or afternoon of surgery. 
Uh, you'll see myself, you'll see the anaesthetist who will discuss the uh, relative anaesthetic techniques uh, with you. Um, during and after the operation, you'll have close monitoring. Um, commonly, patients stay in hospital two nights. Very occasionally, you have someone who goes home the next day, but two nights is normal. Clearly, if you have problems, um, some patients feel nauseous after an operation or a little bit lightheaded and dizzy. You're not sort of discharged the next day or the day after. If you're unwell, you stay in as long as necessary. But the average length of stay is around two nights. The day of surgery will fully weight bear you. Um, so if your operation is in the morning, hopefully after lunch, we'll get you sat out in a chair, bending the knee. Then you might walk with help from a physio or a nurse with crutches or a frame uh, from the chair to the loo and back. And that would be a really good first day of, uh, of rehabilitation. And whilst an inpatient, you'll be doing exercises and have um, intensive physiotherapy um, around twice, twice a day for your uh, two day stay. After a knee replacement, a knee replacement is very painful. Um, you must take painkillers. Um, it remains quite painful for a good uh, two to six weeks to be over the worst of it. Um, and it takes another few months to settle down. But pain is normal. We're surgically cutting the bone and this is sore. We give you lots of pain relief um, and everyone's different in the strength of painkillers that they need. And you'll be discharged home with the appropriate painkillers that help you. Some patients feel a little nauseous and we give you medication to help sickliness. Uh, we try and avoid changing the dressings, but we keep the wound uh, covered with a sterile dressing. Um, and this is usually changed in the community when you have the stitches or staples out at around 10 days to two weeks after the operation. You'll have blood tests and an x-ray afterwards to make sure everything's OK. And you'll be really, really encouraged to get out of bed and do your exercises and really get going. And this is the rapid recovery protocol. Any operation carries uh, benefits and risks. Fortunately, risks of knee replacements are uncommon, but um, during the operation, it's possible to injure nerves and arteries and veins. This is uh, fortunately very rare, less than one in a thousand. Uh, occasionally there's excessive bleeding and one would need a blood transfusion after the operation. This is becoming less and less common nowadays. Um, there can be damage and um, perforation of the bones during an operation, uh, very rarely a fracture, which um, I can't remember the last time I saw, but um, it is obviously a, a theoretical risk. During recovery, it's important to keep the wound nice and dry. We worry about infection. We give you antibiotics during and after the operation to prevent infection, but it's important to keep the knee uh, wound covered, dry, avoid getting it soaked in the bath and avoid um, uh, pets, etc., sort of sniffing and in the best intentions, licking uh, near the wound because that can cause um, infections. Uh, blood clots and thrombosis um, are uh, a risk and you're more at risk of this if you're sitting and not moving around. So it's important to get up and about. And we give you blood thinning tablets commonly for two weeks to help prevent deep venous thrombosis. Um, obviously it will be sore, you'll be walking with walking aids, often with a limp for a few weeks, and the knee will undoubtedly be stiff and swollen and this settles over time. Years and years after the operation, um, knee replacements can wear out due to the plastic bearing failing, and we call this aseptic loosening. Occasionally patients fall over or have an accident and you can fracture around a hip or a knee replacement, and occasionally infection can manifest uh, late, and uh, this can be due to bloodborne infection from a serious illness like pneumonia, or it can be a, an infection from other sources like a urinary tract infection. So this poor patient here has a very severe deformity. You can see both knees are very severely bowed. We call this a varus malalignment, and this is very common. And uh, this uh, patient's deformities were not correctable so we had to do a more stabilized knee replacement, which you see here on the X-ray. But importantly, on the middle picture, the middle X-ray, you see that afterwards the knee is lovely and straight. So even very severe deformities we can correct with our Vanguard knee replacement. If you leave it too long, this is an example of a patient I saw about 10 years ago. 
this poor chap had neglected his knee arthritis, left it uh, far too long and presented with a very severe deformity. His knee joint was subluxed and he'd eroded the bone. And we had to do a very complex and constrained knee replacement. And this is a situation we need to try and avoid because the results of this type of knee replacement are not quite as good as having the more simple total knee replacement. Um, knee replacements do become more complicated and we can go on to rotating hinges. We very rarely use these here at Benenden, but one would use it for severe bone loss or if someone's had severe deformity or ligament uh, damage causing the knee joint to be very, very unstable. So what are the requirements surgically of a good knee replacement? Obviously, we want to cure the patient's pain. We want to make the knee straight, which is restoring that person's individual mechanical axis. Not everyone's leg is straight when they're born. Some people have bow legs, some people have knocked knees, but we're trying to get the knee replacement aligned to your hip and your ankle and try and restore your leg alignment to what it was prior to the arthritic process. We want to take as little amount of bone as possible, preserving the bone in case there's need for future surgery. And we want to get the implants as accurately placed as possible in good alignment, and this then helps uh, prevent early wear and loosening and subsequent failure. Um, recently introduced here at Benenden is the Rosa robotic knee replacement. This has been used in various countries and more recently in the UK. And we did the first Rosa robotic knee replacement at Benenden this week. Uh, on Monday, my colleague Alex Chipperfield did the first Rosa robotic knee replacement, which all went very well and we were very pleased with it. Um, why change? Well, all operations and all medical interventions get better with time. There's new um, improvements to how knee replacements are done. Uh, patients are becoming more demanding. You get uh, often younger patients, but anyone can have Rosa. It's not just due to the, it's not just for those with who are very young and high demand. Anyone can have it to try and improve the outcome of a knee replacement. Uh, the idea of uh, the Rosa robot is to give real time uh, feedback during the operation. So the surgeon knows they're taking the right amount of bone at the right angles. And at the trial stage, when you put in a uh, a knee replacement before the definitive one, you get information on how the knee's moving, are the ligaments balanced? And if all these are correct, then you get the green light from the robot that all is okay. And with a standard knee replacement, you don't get this information. It's all based on surgical experience. So the ROSA is giving us real-time feedback that things are going well during the operation. Clearly, if things are not quite as good as they could be, then we can go back a step and make it make improvements to make the knee replacement as perfect as possible. So the indications, anyone can have a ROSA, uh, but especially we'd be wanting younger patients to consider it, patients with high demands, those who want to get back to sports, perhaps do skiing, where you're putting more demands on the knee replacement and having a little bit of malalignment may lead to uh, early wear and failure. So getting it as perfectly aligned as possible would be very important. People with previous fractures, this patient had a road traffic accident and you can see on the x-rays they fractured both their femur and their tibia. So getting the alignment in a standard fashion during the operation would be very difficult. And this would be an ideal candidate to have the Rosa robotic knee replacement. So the technology, there's a robot in theater. Uh, which you'll see a video of uh, shortly. Um, the surgeon uses the robotic arm, which uh, places various uh, cutting blocks. The robot isn't doing any of the surgery. Um, with a normal knee replacement, I put the cutting blocks on the bone using various instruments to get the alignment. With the Rosa robot, um, we uh, tell the robot where the patient's hip, knee and ankle is in space and time. It's a bit like using satellite navigation, uh, satellites knowing where your mobile phone or your car is. So the robot then knows uh, via um, the satellite navigation technology where your knee is in space and time. And then it tells us the deformity, uh, how tight the ligaments are. And then we can on the screen you see here, that's the screen I see, and uh, I can then input to the computer uh, what cuts I want to do before 
uh, deciding it's the correct surgical plan. And then once we tell the robot we've got the green light to do the operation, all the robotic arm is doing is placing the cutting block um, on the bone in the correct place. If the surgeon or the assistant accidentally moves the, the leg, the robot knows this and the robot will accommodate and move with the patient. So you can't trick the robot. And the idea of this is to make the operation more accurate uh, and also get the feedback during the operation. Um, so this video, a video produced by the Zim Environment, made by the Implements of the This is a Rosen Knee is a robotic surgical assistant for total knee replacement. Your surgeon is specially trained to use the robot. Rosen Knee does not operate on its own. Your surgeon is in the operating room the entire time and making decisions throughout your surgery. Your surgeon creates a plan for your surgery based on your unique anatomy. The robot helps to ensure the plan is executed as intended. Rosen Knee uses a camera and optical trackers to know where your leg is in space. If your leg moves, the robot can tell and adjusts accordingly. Rosen Knee provides your surgeon with data about your knee. This helps to personalize your surgery based on your unique anatomy. So that's the uh, Rosa robot, which um, is a new and exciting technology that we're starting to use here at Benenden. So the, the outcome of the Rosa robot, we hope, is that the knee replacement will be more accurate. Um, studies have shown uh, from America that um, there's less surgical outliers. So uh, there's virtually 100% of cases within uh, three degrees of the intended surgical plan. Um, with standard knee replacements, there's less accuracy, but I must say that um, studies have shown that surgeons who do many hundreds of knee replacements tend to get it right uh, more often than surgeons who just perhaps do five or six or 10 a year. So it's important with any operation to choose a surgeon who's doing many, many uh, knee replacements a year. Uh, so the result should be of any knee replacement. We want accurate component sizing. Uh, knee replacements come in various shapes and sizes, a bit like buying a pair of shoes. They come in sizes and half sizes. So with Rosa or with standard knee replacement, we take measurements during the operation to get the exact size for your knee. I've never known a patient have a knee where a normal off-the-shelf knee replacement doesn't uh, doesn't fit perfectly and doesn't work. Uh, we want an excellent uh, range of movement on table. Um, it must be stressed, I think, it's important to realise that the range of movement a patient has before the operation is one of the determining factors of the range of movement. So if your knee has been very stiff and you struggle to get it straight and struggle to bend it beyond a right angle, it's not realistic to expect a knee replacement to give you the range of movement you had um, as a child. It will hopefully be better than what you started with, but it may not be the perfect range of movement that you had before the arthritic process um, uh, took hold. And this is all of my colleagues who do uh, knee replacement surgery. And any one of us would be happy to see and assess you in clinic. Well, thank you for your uh, attention, and I hope the uh, presentation was enjoyable, and we can now open the floor to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Goddard. Okay, we have quite a few questions that have come through already, um, and if you're considering asking a question, please do use the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, our first one is, how soon after the consultation could surgery commence? Um, that depends on a number of factors. Obviously, um, 
hospitals have um, operation lists that are planned. So commonly, if you don't need any extra medical tests or don't need to see the anaesthetist uh, for extra sort of medical checkup, we would be hopeful that your knee replacement could be scheduled within six to eight weeks after the consultation, occasionally earlier if there's a space, but often the theatre lists are well booked up six weeks in advance. So I usually advise patients it's better to come early if you've got holidays or important uh, life events planned. It's better to have the consultation early and it's easier to plan an operation. If I see you tomorrow, it's a lot easier to say you want your operation in July rather than say you want it next week. But generally, um, we can sort of try and accommodate within six to eight weeks. Thank you. Um, Maria says, if I already have an arthroscopic operation, suffer from osteoarthritis, I am 60, so I wonder whether I would benefit from any further operations. I have a swollen left knee and pain every day. Um, well, it sounds it sounds from the you know from the basic information I've got that you have quite significant arthritis. If there's a lot of pain and swelling, um, if you've already had an arthroscopic surgery, then repeating the arthroscopy is usually not beneficial. Um, we would want to see you in clinic, get an X-ray, possibly an MRI scan to look into it further. If these show there's full thickness cartilage loss. Um, then a knee replacement is probably the next step. Um, if the scan showed there's moderate arthritis but not severe, we'd want to be delaying a knee replacement operation, trying the injections and that type of thing first. Um, this is dependent on patient's age. For example, if you're younger than 60, we would want to try and preserve the joint for as long as possible. But that said, if you have severe arthritis, we would do a knee replacement. If someone comes who's 85 with sort of moderate arthritis, then we'd say, well, let's just go on ahead and do a knee replacement because we appreciate it's going to get worse and the knee replacement's going to last a good 20, 25 years. Uh, but I'd probably say to answer your individual question, we need more information with X-rays and MRI scans to get a, a grip of how severe the arthritic process is. Thank you. That actually relates to Alison's question. She says, um, why would my consultant be saying that she's too young for a partial knee replacement? She was diagnosed in 2020 and it's getting worse and worse. She's now 58 and her lifestyle is massively reduced by the pain and instability that she experiences. Yeah, it's a common, a common question, actually. When I, all those years ago, when I was a surgical trainee, my supervising consultant wouldn't be doing knee replacements on patients under 60. So it would be my job in clinic to see these poor people and say, you know, we can't do a knee replacement, painkillers, come back when you're 60, that type of things. Times have changed and we try to avoid a knee replacement if one is too young, but 58 certainly is a good age to consider a partial knee replacement. Um, generally speaking, um, if you're under 50, we really try and avoid a knee replacement. The youngest knee replacement I've done is someone who was 39. So it's not saying we won't do it. We would do it in anyone who needs it. But knee replacements don't last forever. So if you have a partial replacement, they commonly don't last as long as a total knee replacement in studies. So you may be looking at 10 to 15 years. And so if you're 50, that may wear out when you're 60 or 65 and then you'd need to have that changed to a total knee replacement. And there are only so many knee, replacement you, knee replacements you can have before running out of options. At 58, if your x-ray showed severe arthritis, I think I'd be you know, happy to do a partial knee replacement for you. Um, even a total knee replacement uh, if, if patients have got severe arthritis needing it. Thank you. Um, how long does Duralane the injection Duralane last and how effective is the option? Ah, now, this is a very difficult question to answer. Um, I see it either works or it doesn't. So a steroid injection um, you probably have, and most people who have a steroid injection would say it's helped a little bit. So it might help for a few days, a few weeks, a few months. Um, Duralane seems to be the exact opposite. It's not a painkiller. It's not an anaesthetic. It's not an anti-inflammatory. 
So we usually inject a bit of local anaesthetic into the knee, then you have the Duralane, it's gel. Most patients find the knee is a bit sore and irritable for a day or two, and then it settles down. Um, commonly, it takes a good few weeks to notice if it's had a good effect or not. Some patients, after a few weeks, don't notice a benefit, and I probably then declare that the injection hasn't worked for you. But on the flip side of the coin, a lot of patients have a good long-lasting benefit, and it can last three months, six months, nine months, up to a year. Everyone's different. But at virtually all the clinics I do um, here at Bendon and elsewhere, I have patients who come every three months, every six months, every year for a repeat Duralane injection. And if it works for you, then patients tend to have a good number of years benefit from them. Great. Thank you. Um... You have mentioned curing arthritis by a knee replacement, but is it possible that arthritis can return after a knee has been replaced? So osteoarthritis, as we saw on one of the earlier slides, is the damage and wear and tear and crumbling of uh, the articular surface. Uh, so think of it like a car tyre. The car tyre is worn, and when the new tyre goes on, that ball tyre has been fully cured. So when I do a knee replacement, if it's a full knee replacement, a total replacement, I cut away all of the arthritic surface. And if I replace your kneecap as well, which commonly I do in virtually everyone, then there's no uh, place left in the joint for arthritis to come back. Um, if someone has inflammatory arthritis, then the damage to the joint is replaced but the inflammation of the arthritic process, such as rheumatoid, is still there. And patients can still have swollen and achy joints from the soft tissue inflammation. Uh, but the most common arthritis that patients have is osteoarthritis. And that's fully cured with a full knee replacement. Thank you. Christine asks, are you awake throughout the operation? That's a very good question. Uh, commonly, you would have a spinal anaesthetic. So if I was to have a spinal anaesthetic now, I would be awake as I am, but I wouldn't be able to feel my uh, body from the waist down. So you would appreciate uh, the leg is moving. You'd appreciate that someone's moving your body, but you wouldn't feel any pain, any touch or anything like that. Most patients don't like the idea of being awake, hearing the operation, feeling things happen. So the anaesthetist often gives them some sedation, which is not an anaesthetic, but it's a sedative, you fall asleep. Um, and then after the operation, they switch off the sedation and then you wake up. The beauty of the spinal anaesthetic is that in the hours after the knee replacement, you've got good pain relief. You can sit in the chair, you can start to move the knee you will slowly feel the sensation come back. And instead of having severe pain, you'll feel an ache at first. You can then tell the nurse that your uh, spinal's wearing off and then they'll start giving you the painkillers. If you have a general anaesthetic, you're asleep for the operation under full anaesthetic. But as soon as the operation's over, the anaesthetic's turned off and you will then feel quite severe pain. And then patients have a poor start. So that's why we really like as surgeons to, to for the anaesthetist to do the spinal anaesthetic. The vast majority of people would have the spinal and sedation. So they're not truly awake and truly hearing the operation and feeling it. A few patients want to be awake, bring music to listen to. And a few patients actually keep awake and try and chat to myself or the other surgeons. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's brave. Um so Jane says, um, are there any existing health conditions that would exclude surgery? She has AF and she takes warfarin. So most normal health conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, AF, atrial fibrillation, um, most heart conditions, previous um, heart attacks, previous uh, stents, anything like that, it's very common to have a knee replacement. If you've got a multitude of health problems, then we'd probably want the anaesthetist to check you over before the operation in pre-assessment clinic to make sure that it's safe to have an anaesthetic. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation, um, we would stop your blood thinning tablets, the warfarin, B 
before the operation and then restart it afterwards to prevent bleeding during the operation. But it's very, very common. You know, once or twice a week, I'll be operating a knee replacement on someone who's got atrial fibrillation, and it's not a contraindication. The main contraindications are infective processes. So if someone had, um, say, diabetic leg ulcers or an open wound on the side, on the leg we were going to operate on, this would definitely be a contraindication because of the high risk of infection. And patients with severe vascular disease who've had operations on the arteries and veins behind their knee would have to think very carefully about doing a knee replacement because we could damage uh, the uh, the arteries that have been either replaced or bypassed. So there are a few specific contraindications, but the vast majority of people uh, we can do a knee replacement for. Okay. Um, is there an upper weight limit for you to consider before you would operate? You, um, to answer the question the other way around, here at Benenden, we have a BMI. So it's not your weight, it's BMI is your weight over your height. So it depends on how tall you are, but they have a strict BMI limit of 40. Um, so if one is overweight and the BMI is above 40, we'd advise you here at Benenden to lose a bit of weight, obviously diet, exercise, try and get the BMI below 40, which patients usually manage to do. Um, and then um, it makes the anesthetic, the surgery and the recovery a lot easier. Uh, I have an odd few patients who can't get their BMI below 40 and the NHS hospital I work at doesn't have a BMI cutoff and I offer knee replacements to anyone whose BMI is over 40 at the NHS hospital. But here at Benenden and most private hospitals, they do have a BMI uh, cutoff, which is usually around 40. Thank you. Um, this person asks if you can reflect back um, how, what did how tight the ligaments are mean? <laughs> um, as the arthritic process uh, develops, the ligaments begin to contract. So most patients are born with a, uh, a neutral straight leg. If you look in a mirror, the knee is straight. There's obviously a, a normal anatomical variation. People can have knock knees and bow legs. But just say the average person has a straight leg. With arthritis, commonly it's the inside of the knee, the medial side, that's affected mostly. And as that cartilage crumbles away, the knee joint becomes bowed. If I saw you within a year of that happening, the, the ligament on the inside of the knee is probably correctable. And that means in the examination of your knee on the uh, examination couch, I can make your bowed leg go straight. And that means the soft tissues and the ligaments are correctable. And that knee possibly would be a, a good knee to have a partial knee replacement on or a total knee replacement. Um, however, if the deformity is not correctable, that means the soft tissues and ligaments have contracted and got very, very tight. And the deformity is not correctable. And that means more surgery needs to be done to correct the deformity with various ligament releases. And sometimes that needs a more constrained type of knee replacement, which we often decide before the operation and occasionally uh, during the operation we will change. But what I meant by that slide was it's the deformity that's either correctable or not correctable. So if you have medial arthritis and the deformity is not correctable, it's not a good idea to do a partial knee replacement. Okay. Tim asks, does a previous successful crusate ligament replacement impact the success of a knee replacement? Um, with all total knee replacements, the cruciate ligament, the anterior cruciate ligament is sacrificed. And so if you have a native ACL, if you have injured your ACL and had it reconstructed, uh, or if you've injured the ACL and not had it reconstructed, it doesn't halter the uh, success of a total knee replacement because the ACL is taken during the operation. And the conformity and design of the knee replacement compensates for the ACL stability. Um, if you're thinking of a partial replacement, then an ACL injury is often a contraindication to having a partial knee replacement. 
most patients who've injured the ACL would end up having a total knee replacement, uh, even if you've had an ACL reconstruction. Um, there are some surgeons who are doing ACL reconstructions and uh, partial knee replacements. I'd probably say at the moment, this is more experimental and there's no long-term studies to suggest, oh, is this a good idea in the long term or not? But as a general rule, if you've injured your ACL, you can still have a total knee replacement. Um, how soon could someone travel after having surgery? For example, if they were to live in, say, the northwest of England and they wanted to have surgery in Kent, but they wanted to travel home like two to three days afterwards, is that feasible? Um, I mean, here at Benenden, we're fortunate enough to have patients travel all over the country. So I've had patients from Nottingham, I've had patients from North Wales, from South Wales. Uh, so patients do manage to travel a good number of hours. But you have to remember in the first few days after a knee replacement, it's painful, it's swollen. Ideally, you wouldn't want to be sitting in a car for hours on end. So you probably have to plan your journey very carefully. So if it's a five hour drive, you probably want to be stopping every an hour and a half, every two hours to get out of the car, stretch your legs, that type of thing. It can be done, um, but um, certainly you need to think about it very carefully. Um, another option is to obviously stay local for a, a, you know, for a couple of weeks, but often that's fraught with difficulty because it's not in your own home and that type of thing. But I'd probably say it can be done, but you have to be one, stoical about it, and two, plan your journey carefully such that you can, we don't want you sitting in a car for six hours, the knee getting stiff and sore, and you having trouble when you get home. But um, I'd probably say if you got out of the car every hour and a half, stretch your legs for 20 minutes, it's probably doable. Okay. Um, how long after surgery could one walk fairly normally, e.g. for a mile or two? So, yeah, that's a very good question. So what's the normal recovery? So the day after the operation, um, it's definitely walking uh, with aids. You're walking on the ward up and down the corridor. The physios will teach you to do a flight of stairs. Even the day of the operation, if it's done early in the day, you'll walk from the chair to the loo. Um, the first two weeks is really pottering around at home with or without crutches, with or without a stick, everyone's different. You'd be doing your exercises as much as possible. I recommend uh, five minutes of exercise, 10 minutes of exercise every hour on the hour in waking hours to get the knee moving. You're pottering just from room to room. You're not expected to walk a long way. Uh, by six weeks, most people are back driving. The knee still sore. Most people are able to walk for 20 minutes around the supermarket, that type of thing. And I, I have patients who walk a, a mile within the first six weeks, but I'd probably say a sensible aim is probably two to three months to be comfortably walking a mile or two. Uh, most patients, say, who want to play golf are back doing a half round of golf at three months and a full round of golf, which is probably four or five miles, um, you know, at four or five months. But everyone's different. Some patients come at six weeks saying, I've walked a mile. But it, it's really the take home message is you need to get the knee moving to prevent stiffness. Everyone will be able to walk, uh, but just potter around at home for the first few weeks and build up slowly. What we don't want you doing in the first few weeks is doing a long walk, the knee becoming swollen, and then you're less able to do your exercises. And then you take a step backwards, unable to get the knee moving. But generally speaking, six weeks to three months, you're built to walk a mile. I think that relates to quite a few questions we've had, like how soon can I get back to playing tennis or going running or skiing? I guess the answer, it depends on the person. And... Yeah, so I'd, I'd probably say to all of these questions, you can do all of these fantastic things. Um, you have to remember it's a metal and plastic knee replacement. Some things are sensible, some things aren't. So certainly low impact sports, you know, tennis, uh, badminton, all the swimming, all the cycling, you know, a bit of gentle football, that kind of thing. All that's fine. Uh, skiing is high risk. But if you've skied all your life, that's fine. I'd probably give it a good six months to nine months a year before you go skiing. Uh, sometimes wearing a knee support might just help prevent any ligament damage with skiing um, and running. I usually say running isn't sensible after a knee replacement. I have many patients who ignore what I say and do run. Mm -hmm. You can run, 
but you have to remember it's it's a plastic and metal knee replacement and the more pressure and impact you do the more quicker it's going to wear out so you can run but in my opinion it would be more sensible to do more swimming and cycling than sort of long distance running thank you we've got many more questions i'm afraid we won't be able to answer them all but we will answered via email afterwards. I'm just going to put two last questions into one, which is, do you have an upper age limit for a new replacement? And if so, if someone's older, does it take them longer to recover? Say for example, an 83 year old male. Um, 83 is a common age to have a knee replacement. So the average age in the UK is around 66, 67. Uh, that means patients are younger and older. Uh, the age range as I've operated on is uh, 39, the oldest being 92. So that there's no upper age limit. Clearly, the older you are, it's a big operation. The harder it is to recover, uh, recover from the operation and recover your strength and get walking, do your exercises. 83 is a perfect age to have a knee replacement, so it shouldn't be a problem. It's usually not age that's the cut off it's usually medical health in combination with age so if patients have memory problems or dementia and are elderly those patients tend not to do terribly well with a knee replacement but if you're in your late 80s uh, you can still have a knee replacement uh, if and and recover perfectly well um, in your 90s it's possible but you have to remember it's a big operation and a lot of stress for the body and we try and avoid big operations that are not absolutely necessary on people who are very elderly in their 90s but in your early and mid 80s that's not a problem and it's very routine um you know every week i'd be operating on someone who's in their early 80s 85 that type of age so that's not an issue well thank you thank you very much for going through all these questions and um if you did ask a question and we didn't um Get time to answer it if you provided your name we will get to answer yours via email as i mentioned earlier um mr goddard would you mind moving on to the last slide of course yeah no problem thank you um so as a thank you for joining this session we are offering 50 percent off the value of your consultation a call back from your dedicated paraphy patient advisor an email tomorrow with a recording of this session and further information and updates on news and future events We'd be grateful if you could complete a survey at the end of this session that so helps us to shape future events. If you'd like to discuss or book your consultation, our private patient advisor, Chelsea, can take your call until 8.30 p.m. this evening or between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday using the number on the screen. You can also book your consultation on our website with the discount code NEE50. A link to book will appear once you have submitted your survey response. Our next webinar is on urogynecology, which you can sign up to via our website. So on behalf of Mr. Goddard and our expert team at Benden Hospital, I'd like to say thank you for joining us today and we hope to hear from you very soon. So thank you and have a good evening and goodbye.